If you're not loading data in the most efficient way, you could be drastically hurting the performance of your React applications. So let's take a look at what a waterfall is in React, how it can hurt your performance, and a few different ways that you can help improve it. A lot has changed in React recently. The way we do things in React, and specifically I'll talk a lot about Next.js and the capabilities that it enables on the server has changed the way we build React applications. And that impacts what best practices are for loading data into our apps. Now I found this article called Fetch Waterfall in React from the Century team, it's actually from Lazar. I've linked to this article. I recommend reading through this entire thing. The demos and everything are great. I'm gonna kind of go through this and we'll introduce what the waterfall effect is in React, a few different ways to fix this, and one specific tip that's not React specific, but you should be doing with JavaScript regardless, not just in React. So let's first introduce the idea of the waterfall. Now he does a pretty good job here of giving you some graphics to explain what this is. So he's kind of showing from the Sentry dashboard, Sentry's for error tracking, alerting, et cetera. I'm working with them as a partner and really enjoying it. But this graph through Sentry is showing that there is a request being made to a Pokemon endpoint. That happens first. And then next, after that has finished, there is a separate request to the encounters endpoint. And then after that, there is a request to a location area based on the uh, area that the Pokemon has been found. And the problem with this is that they're happening one after another. So you make one request, you wait for that to finish completely. Then you make the second, you wait for that to finish completely. And then you go to the third and you wait for that to finish, although that's the last thing. So maybe you already have an idea of something that you can improve here. Take a second before you watch the rest of the video and let me know in the comments what you think. But here's kind of the same thing just in the Chrome developer tools. And again, it shows this waterfall of request, splashdown, request, splashdown, request. So what does this look like inside of a React component? Now, this is how we've done React for a long time, but things are changing with modern frameworks like Next.js, which we'll talk about in a minute. So inside of a given component, you have to do all this boilerplate code. We've probably written this, I have 50 to 100 times where you have some sort of data in state and you also have some sort of loading indicator, which starts off as true because you're trying to load data. You use your use effect hook and inside of that, you fetch your data, which sets the data to data property in state to the data that you loaded and then sets loading to false. And then here's the killer. You, you display a spinner while you're loading and then another component after it's finished. Now, the interesting thing and in how this ties into that waterfall, there's actually kind of two different perspectives here. There's component waterfall, and then there's just request waterfall, and we'll address each of these individually. So here, from a component perspective, if we are loading data and then not loading this component until after that initial set of data is loaded, and you can imagine that this another component also then loads its own data, you start to visualize the same waterfall from a request perspective with component loading perspective. So in the top level component, you load data, wait for that to finish, then you render this next component, which also makes its call to loading data. When it finishes, it makes the it displays the other component, which makes it request. So you can see how there's two sides of this. One is just fetch request um, waterfall, and the other is how that displays itself inside of components. So this gives you a good example here. A fetches data, then B, blah, 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 what we've been talking about. Now there's a section on here about using suspense to avoid fetch waterfall. I'm going to skip over this. You can read through this part if you want to. I'm skipping this because I don't really see suspense being used all that often outside of the context of Next.js, which we'll talk about in a second. So I'm going to skip this. I'm actually going to go a little bit out of order and I'm going to move down to the bottom part. So let's talk about moving the fetching of this data to the server to avoid a waterfall. Now I'm a big proponent of moving as much as we can to the server, which falls in line with what modern frameworks are doing and encouraging like Next.js and Remix and Svelkit, et cetera. But moving stuff to the server doesn't exactly solve your problem. So let's say we take the same example and we load all this data on the server. So we make a call to load the Pokemon, then we wait for that to finish, then we call load for encounters, then we go through each encounter and load the location for each one of those. Now, the problem with this is we still have this fetch waterfall in place. This will load all the data and then send the data to the browser. Talk about that in a second. But we still have a waterfall of how that data is loaded. And we can see this inside of this example on Sentry as well, where it also tracks not only the fetch request from the front end, but also full stack through the back end as well. And in here, it kind of shows you that same idea where the time to first byte is now delayed. Why is that? Well, time to first byte is the time it takes from the request going to the server, from the server back to the browser and the first byte being received. 
Since the server is loading all of this data on the server before it's responding, it has to finish that whole thing before it sends that first byte back. So why is this bad the way it's set up here? Well, you still have that waterfall just happening on the server. You just move the waterfall from the front end to the back end. So although you're taking advantage of loading the data on the server, the time to first byte is now incredibly slow because you're waiting for all that to be loaded before actually responding back. You can see this in this example. He gives some great uh, callouts here for timing. On the client side, your time to first byte is 62 milliseconds. On the server or doing the data fetching on the server, your time to first byte is 855 milliseconds, which is way too long. That's not what we want at all. There's a couple of ways around this though. The most important thing actually has nothing to do with React at all. It just has to do with how we process asynchronous requests in JavaScript. So if we look inside of here, we're using something called promise.all. I actually did a video explaining promise.all. If you want to check it out, you can. But promise.all basically allows you to kick off multiple different asynchronous requests that all return promises and then wait for all of them to be done before actually looking at the return values. Now with promise.all, it takes all those promises and it kicks them off to allow them to run in parallel. That more or less means they run at the same time for the purposes of this discussion. And then when they finish, they basically all trigger back and promise that all waits for all of them to finish and then gives you access to this. Now, the big benefit of this is that you can lump these two together to have them be running in parallel. So first we have fetch Pokemon and we have fetch encounters. Both of those can be run at the same time or in parallel. Then when we get all that data back, we can now get the locations for each different encounter which would be multiple different API requests sequentially, we can now use promise.all to let each one of those run in parallel as well. So this is the solution to solving the waterfall effect from a fetch perspective with just JavaScript, regardless of React. You can see now that this is going to fix that waterfall problem, which we introduced on the server, and it improves the time to first byte to 101 millisecond, 121 milliseconds, which again is because we're running those requests in parallel and then able to send the data back to the browser much quicker than running them all sequentially. Now I mentioned that I would talk a little bit about suspense and this is actually really important. So I wanna talk about suspense specifically from the perspective of Next.js. So with Next.js 13 and 14, React server components are becoming the default inside of the app directory. So this means for components that need to load data, they're going to load data on the server before being sent to the browser. And there's one key component of this that is really important. And that is that if you include a loading component for a given server component, what happens is it will kick off the request to load whatever it, de it needs asynchronously on the server. Before it finishes getting that data, it will return to the browser with a placeholder for where that data should go. This is going to improve the time to first byte because it's more or less able to respond immediately while it kicks off the background request to be able to get the asynchronous data. So the time to first byte is going to be good. It'll show the loading component based on the loading component that you defined in your app directory. And then when that data is finished fetching on the server, it will stream those updates to the browser. So the time to first byte is great. You have a loading indicator showing that something is being loaded, and then you automatically get that data shown once that process is finished. Now, I think this is kind of the best of both worlds, being able to move stuff to the server, also having built-in support through Next.js for a loading component, which uses suspense boundaries behind the scenes, but they abstract this so you don't have to worry about it at all. You just create a loading component in that same route and it'll take care of the rest for you. And if you combine this with using promise.all for the fetch requests that do happen on the server, you're now optimizing how those requests are happening by running them in parallel, and then you're optimizing by taking advantage of React server components. So you basically are bypassing all the issues that are listed in here, both the waterfall from a component perspective and the waterfall from a fetch perspective. If you're curious to learn more about what this looks like, I just did a video on a new tool from Sentry called Spotlight, which is directly integrated into Astro, but gives you a view similar to what you see inside of the Sentry dashboard like this one here. So it shows you all of your requests that happen and then how much, uh, how much time each one of them takes up both from the front end in the browser and the back end on the server. So you get a full stack view of all of your requests and you can kind of gauge whether or not you're having any waterfall issues in your applications and then take some of these steps to go and improve them yourself. So check out that video to learn more about Spotlight. Hope you enjoyed this video and I'll catch you next time.